I'd like to start the webinar today by acknowledging the tra uh, traditional custodians of the lands of which all of us here today live and work uh, and recognise their continuing connection to the land, water and communities. I pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Today's webinar is called Extreme Weather Hazards Under a Changing Climate and our presenter is uh, Andrew Dowdy from the Bureau of Meteorology. Andrew leads the hubs projects which are focused on extreme weather hazards. And so I think without further ado, I'll pass over to Andrew and um, we'll get started. Andrew has had some issues with his video, so he'll just be uh, phoning in today to give his presentation. So over to you, Andrew, thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And um, welcome everyone to this presentation on the outcomes from project 5.5, extreme weather hazards in a changing climate. Can everyone hear me okay, Sonia? Yeah, loud and clear, Andrew, thanks. Great, great. So natural hazards are commonly associated with extreme phenomena in Australia, such as cyclones and thunderstorms, and the hazards that those phenomena cause. The challenge addressed was that these phenomena are likely to change in a warmer world, including their hazards and the costs associated with them. So Project 5.5, address significant knowledge gaps on many types of hazards, including tropical cyclones, bushfires, thunderstorms, and east coast lows. Next slide, please. So we addressed the challenge by doing new research that delivered outputs targeted to stakeholder needs. We produced a range of outputs, and some of those are listed here, examples included new tools for fire agencies, improved tropical cyclone guidance, improved methods for modelling east coast low hazards in the future projected climate, hail occurrence quantified from radar observations around Australia for the first time, and a novel framework for delivering extreme event information based on compound events as some examples. But the project website has many others if you want to explore that further. Next slide, please. All good, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks. Um, the project covered the Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO, as well as four unis, with a focus on extremes and disaster risk reduction. And there were many people involved over the years, as listed here, as, many, as well as many other collaborators and co-contributors. And there's some links there for more details on various papers and things, outputs provided from the whole team. Next slide, please. So some of the highlights from the project will be covered in this presentation and some are listed here, centred around the delivery and uptake of project outputs and how these have been used by our stakeholders for their applications. Examples included for use in emergency management applications, including within AFAC, the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Authorities Council, and AFAC sent our research synthesis brochures to all of their partner agencies for use in their policy development and adaptation practices. And that included all of the state fire agencies and emergency services organisations around Australia. And also the Royal Commission and state inquiries following the 2019-20 the Black Summer used a lot of our research outputs as well. And this included in their final reports where they included many figures extracted from our project research publications. So examples such as these demonstrate the value of scientific research in guiding policy recommendations and changes in practices coming from this, these types of inquiries. The project research has been used in a lot of environmental applications. And some examples listed here, including for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, the Threatened Species Recovery Hub of NESP, the Gondwanan Rainforest and World Heritage Planning applications. It also provided the foundation for hazards information delivered to the main finance sector groups in Australia. This was done through the Climate Measurement Standards Initiative that um, NESP was involved with. Next slide, please. The new bushfire research included the production of a data set of the Forest Fire Danger Index, which measures dangerous weather and drought conditions for bushfires in Australia. The data set covers the period from 1950 to now and is updated automatically each day. 
And so we can now make maps like this one shown here. And this new capability allows us to confidently say that many of the recent events were actually much worse than those experienced previously. So maps like this one were delivered to fire agencies leading up to and also during the 2019-20 the Black Summer. And this allowed fire agencies to see that these were really unprecedented conditions such that different practices and planning may be needed. In addition to delivery to fire agencies, these data have also been provided to many other groups across a wide range of sectors and applications. Next slide, please. So the fire weather data set enables trends to be examined over long time periods in more detail throughout Australia. And for the first time, we can now confidently demonstrate that recent changes in fire weather conditions are attributable to some degree to anthropogenic climate change, including through increased temperatures and humidity changes that can then influence fuel moisture conditions. And this type of figure has been used in many applications, including examples such as the um, State of the Climate reports that the Bureau and CSIRO produce, including 2018 and the recent 2020 report, and for input to things like IPCC reports too. Uh, next slide, please. We also produce projections of changes in fire weather conditions. And these were based on daily data from 15 global climate models that were calibrated to observations for better representation of extremes, as well as downscaling from eight CCAM model outputs and 12 wharf NACLIM ensemble members. So this is much more comprehensive than what had been done previously, so um, it's a bit of a step up in um, confidence rather than looking at a, a smaller number of models or, for example, monthly changes. Um, so having these calibrated daily data from lots of different modelling methods, so an ensemble of ensembles, that allows us to try to sample as much of the uncertainty space as we currently can. And the figure shown here shows projections of the forest fire danger index and with two measures of severity shown for the index greater than a value of 25 so and also greater than its historical 95th percentile at a given location and the results from this are very clear with increased fire danger for Australia during due to increasing greenhouse gas emissions in the future next slide please So as an example of the impact that this research has had, we previously could not confidently say these following points, that human-caused climate change has already resulted in more dangerous weather conditions for fires in many regions of Australia, and that observations show increased danger during summer and an earlier start to the fire weather season, particularly in the south and east. Also, climate models show more dangerous future conditions for all parts of Australia due to increasing greenhouse gas emissions. So we've communicated these points extensively during the project and we've seen some good changes in policy and practices based on this. Next slide, please. The project communication products have enabled outcomes in a number of sectors, including for the emergency management sector. So project research and synthesis products form the scientific foundation of AFAC's discussion paper on climate hazards so AFAX, the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Authorities Council. Um, so the recommendations in that document were approved by the AFAC Council and it's now producing changes in practices for the emergency management sector through Australia, which has got on the ground benefits. So state fire agencies and emergency services are now aware of these changes in hazards and unprecedented conditions occurring more frequently, such that past practices may not always be applicable due to climate change. So the project outputs are enabling evidence-based decisions to be made for various natural hazards in our changing climate, including tropical cyclones, thunderstorms, fires, and so on. So this is re resulting in enhanced resilience and improved climate change adaptation efforts. Next slide, please. So as an example of the outcomes 
of improved advice. Um, AFAC noted the following after the 2019-20 summer fires. They noted improved advice and warnings as a significant factor for why the impacts were not a lot worse than what occurred. So the impacts of that summer were devastating in many ways with many contributing factors, with the examples presented here from AFAC demonstrating that the lives lost and homes lost were much less than what could have occurred given the size of the area burnt, including based on comparisons to past events such as Black Saturday in 2009. Next slide, please. So a key feature of many of the more damaging fires during that black summer were fires that created their own weather systems. And you might have heard that on the news several times during that summer. And this was for thunderstorms forming in the fire plumes. And a meteorological term for these storm clouds is pyrocumulonimbus, or pyrocb for short. And our project research had previously shown that these fire-generated thunderstorms preferentially occur in a particular set of atmospheric conditions. And this is when index values are large, as shown here for the forest fire danger index and continuous Haynes indices. So fire-generated thunderstorms can make bushfires more dangerous. And for example, the project research had shown that thunderstorms in the Black Saturday fire plumes generated their own lightning that then ignited additional fires far ahead of the fire front. Next slide, please. So our project research showed that in recent decades, we've seen an increased number of high risk days for fire generated thunderstorms, particularly in southern and southeastern Australia. And we published several papers which found these trends are likely to continue increasing into the future based on model projections. And this is due to increasing greenhouse gas concentrations. Next slide, please. So we did new research on East Coast lows and considered their energetics and physical processes that drive their formation, including whether they had a warm core, as in the case of tropical systems, or a more cold core, similar to extratropical systems, and how that varied with height. And the third type was considered for hybrid events consisting of a warm core near the ground and a cold core at high, high levels. And the method was tested on high impact historical events and then subsequently applied to reanalysis data for past decades and also to climate model data for future projected changes. And this helps us understand what factors drive the formation of the, the more high impact East Coast low events, which is important to understand in relation to how those might change in the future. And we found that although most types of East Coast lows are expected to decrease in frequency in the future, this may not be the case for the hybrid systems during the warm se season. And those type of events similar to that have actually caused quite significant impacts. And one example is the Sydney to Hobart yacht race in 1998 when many boats sank and six sailors tragically died. Um, so this research has had quite good uptake from stakeholder groups. And one example is that the figure shown here was included by Insurance Australia Group, IAG, in their 2020 report they released on severe weather in changing climate. Next slide, please. The project's um, East Coast Low research on different levels found that the deeper cyclones have the strongest wind speeds and more intense rainfall in some cases. And shown here is an example of our findings with the strongest winds caused by cyclones that are well defined over a deep range of levels through the atmosphere. And similarly for rainfall intent intensity, um, so this is relevant for flood risk as well as water availability planning for this heavily populated region of Eastern Australia. And this is an important development including from a global research perspective because previous research typically focused on examining these types of cyclones only for a single level of the atmosphere, whereas this highlights the benefit in considering the depth and multiple levels. Next slide, please. The project produced a summary of climate guidance for hazards caused by East Coast lows, including details on future changes as some of the examples shown here, including 
East Coast low occurrence, the uh, rainfall and flooding related with them, waves, coastal hazards that can exacerbate East Coast low effects such as sea level rising, and then uncertainties around intensity and duration and um, other aspects of East Coast lows such as wind direction and how that can influence erosion. There's uncertainties also noted for these where um, that's the case. So for more details, there's a reference there to the review paper. Um, next slide, please. For tropical cyclones, we looked at climate trends in the Australian region, including based on observations over recent decades. This shows the downward trend in tropical cyclone numbers, um, including for different intensity systems and things like the number that have made landfall. And for further details, there's the reference there for Chandatel 2019 for the review paper that looks at that. Next slide, please. The tropical cyclone projections, the, um, we produced a web portal that is a way of users being able to access and interact with the data, such as their tracks, densities, coastal crossings, for future project, projected changes from a number of different methods. And we've had good feedback on this portal, including from groups such as the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and provides a better understanding of regional differences in projections, for example. Next slide, please. So we produced a lot of synthesis material on different hazards, and this example here is what we delivered for NEST to finance sector groups through the Climate Measurement Standards Initiative, and it covers um, various information on TCs that they were asking for, including um, noting fewer TCs, but more intense on average, sea level rise exacerbating their impacts, more intense rainfall extremes, and then noting low confidence in some aspects of intensity and regionality, such as whether they'll shift further south, for example. Um, and in cases where we had low confidence, we provided more qualitative information. Next slide, please. Similarly, we provided synthesis guidance on a wide, wide range of other hazards and examples shown here for extreme rain, flood and hail. So examples from this included more intense rainfall, so that's observed increases in intensity for hourly rainfall and thunderstorm related rainfall. And that's similar to what we have found from model results and process understanding. Also noted increased risk factors for extreme floods with more confidence for the coastal and flash floods, but then low confidence for other types of floods. And a potential increase in hail frequency seemed more likely than decrease, but noting large uncertainties around this. Next slide, please. In relation to thunderstorms, we managed to get a new data set made available online, and it's a nationally consistent grid of lightning density. And this has been used in a wide range of stakeholder applications, including for energy sector, finance sector, emergency management, and um, for Standards Australia for an update to national standards that's used for infrastructure design and other purposes. Next slide, please. We produce new products, data products for hail, and this hail analysis was based on radar data shown here for regions around Australia. And this has been used for various applications, including in the finance sector, with hail damage being responsible for many of the most costly hazard events that they have had previously. We've documented the average risk of hail occurrence around Australia for the first time at many locations based on observations over many years from this Bureau of Meteorology's radar network. And we compared results with lightning observations, found some differences, which was interesting, including a bit of an earlier peak in the year for hail events than lightning, and looking at environmental conditions from reanalysis to try to understand the, the, um, the frequencies of currents of hail and lightning, it appears that 
um, hail has got stronger wind shear and somewhat lower freezing levels as compared with lightning. Um, that's using the hourly data from the Bureau's Barra reanalysis product. And these results have been delivered to se severe weather forecasters in the Bureau, which will also help them with their guidance in their operational forecasts of severe thunderstorms and the hazards they can cause. Next slide, please. So these different data sets that we developed, we can also combine them together in an integrated approach. And then what we've done here is combine thunderstorms, fronts, and cyclone data into a compound storm type. And we've also analyzed how that compares with compound hazards, so extreme wind and rain and ocean waves, and also when those occur simultaneously as well. So when do you have extreme wind and rain at the same time and how does that match with these compound storm types? So this type of framework can be useful for some risk management purposes. Next slide, please. Some of the communication products that we've produced based on the research papers um, include some synthesis brochures shown here. We've got a new set coming out soon and also, we produced some review publications where many of the individual papers on specific research topics we combined and synthesized into more um, comprehensive coverage of, of those as well as other available research on a particular hazard. And these synthesis products have been widely used and examples include in the Royal Commission of State Inquiries, State of the Climate, IPCC, Integrated System Plan for the Energy security in Australia, that's um, the AEMO, the Australian Energy Market Operator, released that last year, and some of our paper figures were used in that. Um, the synthesis products and brochures were widely used, including for this policy and practice planning, as well as a lot of media coverage as well. Next slide, please. This is a summary of the synthesis outputs that we managed to get onto a single <laughs> slide of many different hazards covered in the project. And this was delivered by NEST through the Climate Measurement Standards Initiative, but also being used for other purposes as well um, as, a, as a useful way for people that want this level of um, information. Next slide, please. So looking ahead for past this project into NEST 2 and other um, activities underway, there's a lot of stakeholder interest in climate hazards and this appears to be growing. And as well as a growing need for this enhanced evidence-based decision-making. So research is needed to help underpin that. And in particular, enhance, enhance process understanding and modeling of climate hazards. So if we can make better models, then we can make better future projections and to feed into these decision-making needs. Next slide, please. So any questions or comments would be great to hear and thank you.